Next, we have, I'd like to introduce to you Daniel Tool, who is an architect, designer, educator from Daniel Tool Architecture, and he's going to be talking about, <coughs> excuse me, nature and materials. Um, Daniel has the most prized collection, and it is art and architecture books and sketchbooks that he's compiled from all of his travels, which in my conversation with him have been extensive. He would love to learn to fly fish someday, and his two-year-old French bulldog named Shandor is in the audience, so please say hi to Shandor at some point in time. Please welcome Daniel Toole. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited. This is actually the first time that I'm going through my complete body of work. Um, so I'll try and be quick, but it's also really special because my company has only existed for one year. Uh, basically COVID led to leaving the firm that I was with while working on some of these projects that you'll see. And even though it was kind of a risky time, it was like, I think there's enough to go on and it's been a great year. So I'm really excited to show you kind of a full year of production. Um, Daniel Tool Architecture uh, kind of split my time right now between Portland and Seattle, Portland based, but uh, more than half of our work is around the Olympic Peninsula and Puget Sound, Seattle area, and a little bit of work in Miami, and hopefully at some point in Bend. Um, so I'll be, I'll be talking about some of the values that I think are kind of organizing uh, the practice at the moment. Oh, sensitive. Um, I'm gonna go over a little bit, I don't know how close I should hold this. Can you hear me if I hold it down here? Yeah, okay. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Portland in an environment that looks very similar to the left. Um, we moved to Oregon when I was five. My mother's a Hungarian refugee. So I kind of, I didn't think much of it growing up, but it was kind of a unique situation where every year or two, uh, we'd go back and visit my grandma and family in Budapest, Hungary. And I was born in Austria and spent my first five years over there before coming to the suburbs of Portland. Um, and, and I think that those origins and also having an American father and a Hungarian mom who fled communism to Austria and a lot of those things I took for granted as a kid, but I've seen in the pursuits that have made the most sense to me in my work and life that that had a great impact on me. These are some of my favorite aspects of Budapest. One of the, there's a, a great swimming culture there, but the, the pools are like monumental really beautiful spaces. This is a community pool in the lobby of a old hotel. Um, and just the hustle and bustle and layers of history um, versus kind of my life as a young person in the suburbs of Portland, <laughs> spending a lot of time in malls and things like that, which I, once, once I went to architecture school, I couldn't wait to get away from that stuff as quickly as possible. Uh, but there are also even though I wanted to run away from Oregon a little bit, specifically Eugene, where I was studying, um, there were things that have left a permanent mark on me in Oregon. This is the Clackamas River going up to Mount Hood. I spent a lot of time out there with my dad and friends as a kid and learned to drive. And that's always been, basically I'll get through it, but I had to move away from Portland when the recession happened. It's when I graduated and there was no architecture work. But that place has always been, no, no matter how far away from Oregon and even the US that I've lived, that place has been really special to me. And when I was a kid, uh, money was tight. So there was a lot of um, kind of trying to do cultural things in Portland on a budget. So window shopping was a favorite pastime, like walking up and down some of the best pedestrian streets. Northwest 23rd is here. And I actually just opened my first physical office on the second floor above the pub and behind the psychic uh, card, card reading office, which is on the right, which has been there since I was a kid, which is crazy. So coming back to this street where my family didn't have much money and we just really enjoyed being, you know, missing European city. And that's kind of one of the places you can experience that vibe uh, in Portland. But now having my office there is, is a really special kind of circle that's been completed. When I finished school, it was 2008. And the only job that I could find um, was a corporate job in Seattle. So I'd been to Seattle once or twice before, but um, moving up there, this is kind of what the main production for architecture was like. Um, just, just this like 
more materials, the better. And this was considered, you know, modern architecture. And there was a housing boom that had just completed in 08 that really hit the brakes with the recession, of course. So there were a lot of these buildings sitting empty in the city. And then in the periphery, lots of buildings like the upper left. Just there was something that I didn't like about it there, that especially like now reflecting on some of the older places in Europe. It's just kind of a ephemeral quality of buildings. And there's so much money being spent and so much time and resources. And you know, each one of these buildings, you can see like two or three materials. Um, so later uh, in 20, well, around 2010, I got a travel scholarship from the AIA in Seattle to go and look at how alleyways are used. And some of the people that saw the lecture last night, I was kind of obsessed with alleyways in Seattle because I'd never lived in a city with alleys. So I started to really go crazy and spend a lot of time in alleys, which was not normal in Seattle. Uh, maybe not safe all the time either, but um, I, some of these are above are from some of the hill towns in Italy, Rome, exam I kept these little maps that I would cut up and chart out my path for the day along with sketches. And I kept, these are some of my possessions now are these sketchbooks that were really exhaustively documenting all these places I got to visit that I'd seen on slides in class in Eugene. And then realizing that travel scholarships for any young architects in the audience, like those are an amazing way to use other people's money to go and see the world. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, these are some sketches from Finland. Um, just, just seeing how different cultures around the world build, how their cities are laid out, um, what, what the building materials that are used. You know, growing up here in the Northwest, wood is prime. So being in places that use masonry, um, Venice. I have this practice of after a really long trip on the plane ride back, I force myself to do some mental mapping before I fall asleep on the plane and catch up from, you know, the endless amounts of time running around trying to find obscure buildings. So this is one of those mental maps of Venice, just trying to like almost um, summarize the most significant features that sit out to me. And it's something that it's really, it's really, it's something exceptional versus taking photographs. When you sketch something, it's permanently burned into the hard drive of your brain because you really like deliberately considered it. So at a certain point, I just, I, I, I try and travel with people that take a lot of photos so then I don't feel compelled to spend time behind my camera. So after, after a series of trips and then the economy getting better, uh, I ended up going to grad school at Harvard for urban design after falling in love with alleys in Seattle and realizing that the tools of the architect are limited. You know, it, I really wanted to study how can I expand my tool and skill set to be able to approach an entire city or a campus or, you know, things outside the scale of a single building. And then um, over the course of the studies at Harvard, it was a two year degree program, but I stretched it out in three years because it was, well, I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm an older and I'm going to be able to like kill this, going to be easy. It was so stressful that I took a year off and lived in Berlin um, on another scholarship. So that, after working in a corporate office in Seattle for five and a half years, I really wanted to spend time with some of the architects whose books, you know, that I'd studied religiously since school. So uh, that led to working for a suite, these three offices, Barco Leibinger in Berlin, uh, Rick Joy in Tucson, and then coming home to Allied Works most recently here in Portland for the last four years. Um, so Barco Leibinger uh, was a firm I'd admired quite a bit. Uh, one of the partners is from Montana and the other partner is from Germany and they have an office in Berlin. So during my federal research study program, I, I wanted to do like kind of an internship for them during the, the winter break. So I, I, I came in and I started you know, doing some research. And, and then they were like, do you, do you by chance want to help out on a project? We have a project in Chicago and none of the staff speaks great English and we'd love to get your help for a little bit on this. And then it ended up being so involved that I quit my scholarship. I ca canceled the scholarship and then stayed on in Berlin for seven months as the project designer for this um, showroom for a German metal tool like basically stamping, punching, cutting, laser cutting. There's an incredible German company that makes these tools and this is their United States kind of showroom. 
and it was it was built actually it won one of the seven national AIA honor awards I think it's one like the industrial category um, it was finished I think two years ago so uh, while living in Berlin I ended up working in a German office on a project in the periphery of Chicago <laughs> so it was really random but extremely fun and the building came out exceptionally well uh, using you know the sheet metal to express uh, kind of different parts of the building and really trying to use rusted steel throughout the building. You can see on the left there is the office block which has a beautiful courtyard and then a large showroom that bends down to a native wetland and opens to a highway to kind of, this is called Sheet Metal Alley in Schaumburg so you have a Japanese company right next to it, another German company down the road and basically companies that use these big tools fly into O'Hare and take a trip and kind of meet with all these sheet metal tooling companies in this row. So this building, I'd never worked on anything like this, but it came out taking the office block and the showroom and merging it and using the roof shape to kind of unify two buildings and um, dump all the water on this huge roof into a naturally occurring wetland was just a very clean diagram that, that came out exceptionally well. That's the office block all exposed steel on the inside and then because the showroom had to be clear span like this room no columns because of the amount of machinery and equipment that are on the ground floor the trusses started to get quite massive for this but then we started thinking oh these are getting so deep that you could almost fit a body through through the truss and they were like oh what if we make the showroom mainly viewed from inside the trusses and make the structure habitable so it became this cloud of steel and all these trusses were cut with tools that are on display down there, which was really cool. Um, so then moving to 2017, um, I had been in Tucson and the project that I got recruited to go down and work with Rick Joy on got canceled. I met my lovely wife who's here, who's from Tucson. And then I asked her, I said, hey, I think I have an opportunity maybe to move to the West Coast. I didn't know where yet. I didn't quite want to move back to Oregon. I wasn't ready to like fully settle in. But then a friend of mine was like, I think Allied Works really needs someone about your age and your skill level. They're building a museum in Corvallis. And I had actually followed, th th this building has had a gestation period of about 15 years. And I was shocked. I was like, oh, there's going to be an Allied Works Museum in Corvallis. And then during the interview, they were like, we have this project and we're looking for someone like you. So I was like, OK, I'll do it. So I moved back to Portland to manage the Benton County uh, Historical Society's new museum in downtown Corvallis, which just finished this year. Uh, so it was a, a very stressful, very exciting four years to come back to Portland. My parents were ecstatic. and. I think I lost a handful of hair learning how to get a museum built in Corvallis. Uh, when I moved to Portland, the, the, the lot looked like this, and then now if you drive by there, it looks like this. Um, the building is four structural bays, uh, ceramic. Each, each one of these tiles is hand, hand raked and crafted in Japan. But if you go around Corvallis, I never noticed this before, but there's a, a long-standing tradition of ceramic tile fronted buildings from the turn of the century. So this building really sleeves in and mimics the kind of scale of some of these smaller, you know, older buildings that you'll see on any small town's main streets in, in Oregon. Um, and then takes the, t the kind of porcelain facade into 2021 uh, in a very beautiful way. And the roof is modulated to capture north light. And there's this incredible collection, um, the Horner collection, which came from Oregon State. Uh, mixed with a bunch of personal uh, contributions to this museum and it's all about the history of the mid valley and the like kind of the Willamette area and it's an incredible like you expect this in in Corvallis but it's 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 really amazing and it just opened so you should go visit it basically when we finished nobody could go inside because of COVID which was weird um, so coming up uh, there's a main stair and then you enter into the second floor where each one of these 30 foot wide galleries captures north light and diffuses it over all these strange artifacts that have been collected over the years. It's like the most amazing antique shop uh, and you can see all the crazy stuff that's in there. It's, it's really cool and the light is, is really special. And there's bay windows that pop out so you can kind of take a break and look down the main street there in Corvallis while absorbing the collection. So that project finished and then um, there was just not a lot of work. So I 
kind of had to take some unpaid time off at, at the office and then I was thinking you know what I've been working on some side projects in Seattle and I think that there's enough momentum that I think it's time like this is a weird time to start a business but I think it's time to go so last year I started my own office um, and what I'm gonna go over here are some of the core values that I've begun to kind of um, things that were in my subconscious while I was working for some of these other offices and trying to find what, what, what is it going to be my contribution to architecture or what do I want to do differently in the future. So I think um, first and foremost materials are incredibly important to me. Those, that slide that I showed you of all the buildings that were wrapping up in Seattle and that building boom, you know, that it's like a collage of junk. Um, I, I think that very early in practice I really I have kind of an obsessive personality where I just go crazy on research on anything from buying a toaster to what material I'm going to use on a building. So I wanted the, the first set of buildings to really focus each one specifically on one material. Uh, and I think that leads into the next value, which is uh, kind of being in the Northwest, a lot of our buildings are, are built of timber, which is in some ways very, quite temporary compared to say the American Southwest where it's concrete and concrete bricks and adobe, things like that. Um, and then traveling through uh, other, other cultures and U Europe and Japan and China, just seeing buildings that have been built to last thousands of years and how important that is. And I, I don't know if that's achievable with contemporary construction, but I think that focusing on permanence through mass and not just open timber frames, which is something that our region is kind of fixated on, naturally so, because it's part of our heritage. Uh, and then, so, yeah, nature's mass. And then the nature aspect can mean something very different for each project. Sometimes it's about capturing that quality of light that occurs on a site. Sometimes it's about topography. Sometimes it's about how water moves after it rains. Sometimes it's about views, et cetera. So I think these three things really are at the core of everything that's come out of the office so far, and you can kind of evaluate it. Um, some of the inspiration that's been in the background for me have been sculptors like Isamo Noguchi, the American Japanese sculptor from kind of the mid-century. Um, his, his pieces, the one on the far right is in Seattle, actually. His pieces could be modern or ancient and they're so specifically focused on you know that kind of classical sculptural value about looking at a stone or material and asking what does it want to be like what what's what what is this material as a person coming in and not creating something totally new but manipulating that material to make something new what is that material really telling me to do or how how should I treat it I think he is a master of that there's no question his his teacher, Constantin Brancusi, a Romanian French sculptor from the turn of the century. He used a lot of metals and wood and stones. This is a workshop on the right, which is just crazily inspiring. Just seeing this pure approach to these kind of massive totemic um, pieces that could be ancient or could be very modern. Uh, and then recently finding that, that that kind of sculpture existed here in, in our region with uh, J.B. Blunk on the left, who's a, who's, both of these people are, are gone now, but he was a wood carver in Inverness, California, made these incredible big uh, monumental and just sensuous uh, sculptures out of wood, mostly redwood. And then in our region, Leroy Setzel, who maybe you recognize, some, I'm sure there's some building in Ben with some of his pieces in it here. Uh, or at Salishan. It's a favorite of mid-century architects in Oregon to use for doors and panels. But you just see this, this focus on one material yielding such an intense, beautiful connection to history, but also being contemporary. So I think those things have really been inspiring me recently. And then while I was at University of Oregon, I was kind of at uh, the forefront of the sustainability movement, which was good, but I think that design is design needs to be sustainable um, by making good products as well that are going to last and not just be quickly consumed like we've talked about in some of the other talks today. And I was at the tail end of a, of a group of professors that came from Louis Kahn's office, a great American architect um, from the 60s, 50s who practiced in Philadelphia. When he passed away, uh, about six people from his office came to Eugene 
and started teaching at U of O. Most of those people were gone, but there was still kind of the ghost of that um, pedagogy and, and some, of the, some of the values that came from this office. And I think that has always been a guiding light for me. From a library on the left to a house on the right, there's this approach to mass and permanence and a respect for materials and even a little bit of um, kind of understanding how to use the ability to make a building monumental, even if it's as small as a house. I think that's something really powerful. So I'm actually, I'm really excited about this because I uh, just shot my first completed house on Monday and Tuesday and got some unedited photos for this talk specifically. So these haven't been published or anything yet, but I'm gonna show you the first house that I've completed, which I'm really excited about. So. Uh, this started about five years ago. There was, an un there was one unbuilt lot um, for some friends' parents in Madrona, which looks out over Lake Washington. And the uh, wife is Swiss, and the husband is from Philly. And basically, she wanted uh, a Swiss concrete bunker to retire to, and he didn't want to piss off the neighbors. So he found this kind of hybrid of the concrete being the main living spaces down low, the hearth the courtyard and then where the bedrooms are up top and where the, most of the neighbors can see we did it in wood but like I was saying I, I really wanted to especially with this first house explore the sculptural potential even even if we're using wood on part of it how rather than it, like a, a, a timber frame that expresses all the individual elements how can we make something that's strong and massive while still using wood so you'll see this is a concept model, but in the, in the reality, each board, it's burnt cypress on the upper part. The concrete is board formed with rough cedar planks, and the contractor worked with me in an incredible way to align all the boards of the upper portion with the boards that formed the concrete below, which I didn't think was gonna be possible, but um, it turned out really beautiful. So really quickly, the plan is the lower floor, so you have kind of service spaces on the far right, and you can see how close the neighbors are. It's a very tight urban Seattle site, so no windows on the long sides. Some openings here to a street side garden, um, kind of an entry area and a courtyard, and then expansive views of Lake Washington. And then this bar here, the lower bar, has most of the, the place that you spend most of the day in the house with a kitchen and dining room spilling out onto this street side garden and then the living room and double-sided fireplace that can slide out into this covered area here or into this courtyard which really becomes the heart of the house and then things like a laundry office garage stairs up to the bedrooms are kind of held in this two-story compact bar um, the section is really special because because you can see how close the neighbors are it was like how do we you know, it's gonna be beautiful with floor to ceiling glass at two ends, but the spaces in the middle are dark. So we have all this beautiful rough concrete. We really need to show those qualities off with diffuse light to capture the shadows and imperfections. So you can see there are voids like here in the living room, the courtyard itself driving light deeper into the plan, the stair having this skylight here where you couldn't have a window because you'd be looking into the bathroom of the neighbor, but you're getting light from above and really highlighting this deep and carved out house. Um, so this is kind of some of the first attempts at getting the concrete right. Um, you can see the shadows and the fins, learning a lot about the material, not just concrete, but the cedar used to cast this concrete, making sure that it's, dry, it's a little damp and then pouring and letting the concrete dry out and open up these gaps and the contractor was a little worried, like, oh, isn't this too rough? And I was like, no, no, you gotta leave all that. Like, that's, that's beautiful. Um, and then some of the charred cypress flushing out with these board forms of the concrete below. So this was the very happy client there with the first wall, that's her, with the first wall poured that, that will become the living room, you'll see. And just the immense effort of form work required to do uh, concrete, I mean, in Seattle, you could probably find, and probably in Bend, you could probably find 100 good wood contractors or framers, but there's probably two people that can do good concrete just because it's not part of our, our region's specialty. Where, whereas this is, this is the opposite if you go to Tucson, for instance. So um, this, is, this is the finished house uh, on Tuesday night. <laughs> um, and you can see that uh, the, the concrete below and the burnt wood upper 
the, the kind of bedroom wing on the right and then the low living zone shielded from the street by this garden. Um, and just really trying to be careful instead of like tacking on overhangs and trellises and things like that. Any place, because it is, is the reality of the Northwest, we spend time outside when it's raining. So trying to carve into this house, you can see at the entry down here, like a place to clean off your umbrella here for guests to sit out with their coffee and not get rained on. Um, just trying to treat the building as a solid chunk of material and carving into it rather than building up. That was, that was the thesis with this one. And organizing everything inside with floor to ceiling materials, uh, wood and concrete and, and sheetrock in places we had to. Uh, it's a living room and that 15 foot tall double sided fireplace acts as kind of the, the linchpin for the whole house with the courtyard outside and the beautiful views. And we had great fall light and you can see one of those skylights that brings light from above where you couldn't have a window because you'd be looking into the kitchen of the neighbor. And the beautiful light that comes in in the morning and you can see all the texture of the concrete. It's almost like a painting, you know, the, the, the wall becomes the artwork for the house, which is really incredible. Uh, again, that living room skylight. The kitchen, which you can pull the drapes if there's a lot of people in the neighborhood and you have, the, they're big cooks, so their herb garden is just outside these sliding windows, so they go out and pick their veggies out there and come in and cook. Uh, yeah, the kitchen turned out really beautifully. And then the courtyard, this is early in the morning, so you can kind of see the reflected view here of the lake and the damp the dampness of the wood in the morning. So a lot of just embracing the beauty and rawness of materials has been really important to me. And this is the first completed one. There's the, 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 the light scoop in the stairwell as you prepare to go into the more private parts of the house. This is the bedroom, the master bedroom. Expansive view and it was really great, the fall colors. I, I hated that red chair at the beginning and then um, when when we went to shoot it earlier this week, you know, there were the reds and oranges and yellows. I was like, okay, now it, now it makes sense. <laughs> and that's at night on the lakeside. You can see the fireplace roaring here in the middle, firewood storage over here. And the night before we shot, I came up to just clean the house and get it ready and it was raining and it was even more mystical because every, all the concrete was wet, so all the light reflected off everything. It was just a really powerful experience. So the next house is uh, started three years ago, and it's going to replace this little cottage right here that was essentially a beach shack built in the 20s on a lot that has no driveway. It has a scary, like, Indiana Jones treacherous stair up to it. And this was actually this is kind of a special testament to the working process of the previous house. The builder of that house, whereas most builders after something like that never want to see the architect again, um, he hired me to design the house that him and his wife are going to retire into, which was really special. Um, actually, he's watching, so shout out to Phil. Um, his house here uh, is, is a 30 by 30 single floor cottage, and we're, because of the site limitation, this house's essay became on a repetitive timber frame, but instead of a timber frame expressing all the individual elements, I really wanted to treat this, even though it's a fairly compact house, try and treat it in a in a, like almost make a little monumental shrine out of wood as a testament to Phil's uh, fine carpentry skills and his wife's actually a great woodworker too. So they're gonna start building this house this month, which is really exciting. So we came up with a kit of parts and a grid because everything that goes into this house has to be carried up that stairway. So these beams and posts are all off the shelf lumber sizes, all dug fur, a lot of repeating details to get this framework that some places like near the top where it bulges out becomes a panoramic. Oop, I did something wrong. Uh-oh. What do I press? <laughs> okay. Yeah, there we go. So all all these pieces are gonna have to be carried up by two people up that stair. So it's a it's a really simple system. The basement has a yoga studio and his wood shop. The stairs at the left, taking you up to the bedroom floor. And you can see how all the rooms tie into that structural grid. And then at the top floor, it bulges out with kind of a Japanese style covered deck all the way around the top. 
uh, which will offer views to the lake and to Mount Rainier when he hasn't really had a view the whole 20 years living in here. And now this whole top floor is like a wood jewel box looking out over the lake. Um, and this this model, there's a huge western red cedar in the in the back of this house that you could reach out one of the windows and touch when it's done. So the, the first model we made is made out of that same cedar, so you can smell it and the textures are there and you can see the proud owner standing up there at the top. Um, and and my, my dad, when I showed him this, he's like, it looks like a forestry lookout tower, which I was like, that, that's cool. I like that metaphor. And the yoga studio and wood shop where a lot of the pieces of the house will actually be built down here in the wood shop. Um, and then the top floor, literally, there's one box that has the, the powder room or small bathroom, the kitchen and the pantry all confined into that one pod. And then everything else is totally open with that wraparound porch and a stair up to a roof deck on the very top. Um, that led into the next house, which is also wood on the northern tip of Anderson Island, which is the southernmost island in the Puget Sound for some awesome clients who are also watching. Shout out to the Forges. Um, they have this incredible site that e even just going out to this site the first time, I was so excited because everything I'd worked on up until that point had been in the city where the form in many ways is a result of all the setbacks from your neighbors. You know, So here, there's no setbacks uh, other than from the ocean. And there's this incredible naturally occurring meadow in the middle of the site. So this one really kind of the, the way the trees have gathered on this site drove the shape of the house. Uh, you can see it's a fairly big piece of property and there's this naturally occurring clearing in the woods right before the drop off to the water. So they wanted a rental to generate passive income after retirement and then their, their main house is here. So it's kind of a, a, a three, three pods unified I, I like the idea that if there's ever a really big family gathering, you can go from the master bedroom all the way to the furthest guest bedroom in a rainstorm and not get wet. So there's a covered porch unifying all three of these pieces. And it's contorting to the shape of the actual tree line on this meadow. So you kind of take a natural dwelling place of prospect and refuge at the tree line, looking out towards the water with your back up to the woods. Uh, these are some of the initial sketches. There's a really beautiful giant madrone snag that becomes one of the hinge points to separate the kind of um, the house from the rental and the tree line behind and the plan you can kind of see the rooms march along it's fairly compact house and there's little bays of service and bathroom and laundry room and hearth to interrupt these otherwise free-flowing spaces and then everything's unified by that covered deck um, this is the model that we took to the first concept presentation. And this client, one of, the, one of the coolest things about this client is at the beginning of the process, rather than handing me like 20 dwell magazines with post-it notes all over everything, like do this plus this plus this, they were like, we want to treat this like going to a, a sushi restaurant in Japan and we want what the chef recommends. So they let me go for a month and it was incredible. I thought it was going to be hard. I was like, oh, what do I respond to? But I just approached it like, what would I design for my own family? And it was incredibly liberating, and I'm really excited about the product. So you can kind of see this low-slung house that's caught between these trees at the edge of the meadow with kind of an opaque back to the forest with little gaps where you can come in and circulate through the house to find the water through. Um, and this is the approach from the trail. And this big madrone snag that causes the inflection in the plan where it folds around that tree. And we, we leave that and accept it because there's birds of prey that nest in the top and the water beyond. And then you come around the side, and that's the view side where it's glass and less wood, more glass. And each room slides open. So in the summer, you're basically living outside in this thing. Um, a humble material palette of exposed timber structure and plywood, but all stained kind of a driftwood gray to unify all the pieces and make a really calm environment there between the ocean and the forest. Uh, this is one of those corner areas between some of the pods. Uh, this had to be enclosed so that in December when it's a snowstorm, they don't have to walk to their bedroom in the cold. Originally it was open, but then we realized, oh, it can be closed in the winter and then in the summer it all opens up and we treat it like a porch. That's the trail into the woods behind. And then the next house, so yeah, it's been amazing. This is 
besides the house that the finished photos of, all this stuff has been designed within the last 12 months, which is really exciting. This is a really crazy site. Um, awesome client as well, Minku. Um, this is on the southern end of the furthest water body in the Olympic Peninsula, just west of Olympia, on top of an old, what used to be an underwater volcano 50 million years ago. So the views are incredible. That's Eld Inlet coming in. And it's almost like a, you almost feel like you're in some kind of Viking movie in the fjords or something. So there's just, there's always clouds hanging over the site. There's all these alpine mosses and lichens. And this rock formation here that's bulging up through the ground, that is a 50 million year old basalt lava flow that became the kind of conceptual underpinning for this house. So I started, th this was a really cool process because I had some time before we really got going to start using the medium that I use to capture things when I travel. So I keep a watercolor pad about that big. So I pulled those out and I started sketching on the side and thinking like, how could we make a house that's made out of wood but feels like an, it's an extension of that ancient rock formation. So starting to look at the rooms as boulders and caves, like a wooden cave on the bottom right. I was, I was thinking, I'm going to show this to the client, and they're going to fire me and be terrified of what I'm doing. Um, but they weren't. They were really excited. So this was the first, first model we brought to the initial concept presentation. And uh, you can see that the model is it's walnut and maple, but the walnut is treated uh, homogeneously with that stone that's at the centerpiece. And it becomes an almost rock outcrop that can be pulled out of the model. So I pulled that out at the very end of the presentation. He got super excited, which was awesome. Uh, and, but then I think they were like, oh, wait, that's our house? Like, wh wh what is that? Uh, so this is the plan, which is pretty, pretty crazy, but really exciting. That's that basalt formation. So the house you know, wants to be here on the view side, but you can't fit all the rooms. So we ended up kind of taking a long house and encircling this kind of rock formation and treating this like sacred ground and making a protective covering around this rock courtyard, which will be the heart of the house and the place where their new baby will play and their two golden doodles, but also a place where we can replant. And this, this whole site was probably clear cut in the mid 90s or so, it used to be forested. So we're gonna start planting back what would have been here prior to all that disturbance. Um, the bedroom, so the living stuff is on the view side and then all the bedrooms are here on the private side, garage and a guest house. But again, you can see in this section drawing, there's that stone rock outcropping in the middle and the house wants to feel like it gives legibility to that rock that's hidden in this mountain. So this is the house of wooden stones. That's the approach coming up the driveway. This is all cedar, but silvered out to look almost like concrete. And again, with the carving, massive nature of the house and kind of a sense of mystery as you approach and the, the entry is here and as you go in there and ring the bell the siding starts to turn and you get a glimpse into the courtyard of this rock formation and the plantings that will start to spring up around it and then you arrive at the living room dining living dining kitchen suite which looks out on Eld Inlet and uh, extensive woodlands and Mount Rainier's over here uh, just a really tranquil beautiful space that tries to be an extension of natural phenomena already present on the site. There's that rock formation, but now given this protective envelope and planted with what would have naturally grown up here before it was clear cut. And you can see these little towers that pop up here and there. There were two specific program pieces outside of a regular two bedroom house. He wanted a man cave to store uh, all his wine and whiskey collection, which he doesn't buy. He gets his gifts. He's a very successful neurosurgeon who helps people after they've had a stroke, but a lot of the gifts he receives are wine and whiskey. So this is kind of the man cave uh, bar area for all that. And then she wanted a yoga retreat. So it's kind of his and her tower. And then the guest house here with the garage below. This is inside the man cave with that beautiful view. It's a very tranquil, peaceful place where again, we're playing with the light that will come in and highlight this rough cedar box and the view from the back with the bedrooms coming off the house. That's an aerial view from the north of the courtyard at the center and the sunken fire pit out on the view side. So this, this can all be flung open in the summer and you can feel like you're one with the mountain. 
Um, finally, some projects, like I said, I did a master's in urban design, and then after graduating, mainly worked on big houses, which the opposite of urban. Uh, but thankfully, uh, some people got to see this last night. In 2013, kind of the culmination of my obsession with alleys was getting a call, no, getting a message on LinkedIn from a developer in Miami asking if I wanted to come down and help with visioning for some alleys that were going to be in their development. I was like, oh, this can't be real. Nothing good ever comes through LinkedIn. And sure enough, it was real, and they flew me down while I was in school to look at this alleyway in 2013, which was mainly dumpsters and some scrubby plants that weren't doing so good and uh, garbage cans, etc. And I had just published a book after doing a few scholarship trips to go see alleys in Australia, Japan, Chicago, San Francisco, um, Australia, just really trying to find where places were really using the alleys as a resource so that I could bring that knowledge back to Seattle to try and help out there. So they found this book online, which is crazy. You can still buy it, but I never think that anybody's buying it. Um, this development crew had bought it and asked me to come down Oops. And look at this alley. One more. Oop. Sorry. This alley in 2013. It's kind of a series of alleys. And come up with some ideas. So I was really struck by the eclectic Art Deco and kind of Spanish colonial architecture in Miami. I'd never been to Miami before. It's like the complete opposite of Oregon. Um, but I, I, it also made me feel a little bit more liberated as far as being able to use different language architecturally because it's so tropical and the light is incredibly different. The, the sun is really high and the, 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 the ocean air makes all the shadows super crisp. So I, I came up with this idea of like a ruin occupying this alley and giving it a new life and identity through this series of concrete arches. Um, and again, I thought, oh, they're going to think this is a crazy idea or what, are they, what is this guy thinking? But they now it's not going forward. There we go. So this sits down. There's, it ended up turning into two projects, basically rehabilitating these alleyways in an otherwise very shiny new shopping district. And I had been studying uh, conic sections, which I'd never heard of before grad school. But basically, if you slice through a cone, uh, the geometry of the intersection is either a hyperbola or a parabola. So looking at how to use those geometries instead of just archways, try and make a more, slightly more unique contemporary geometry. These were some of the first studies um, once they approved the concept. And then this tiny model that I explained last night, I stayed up all night before the first presentation once they'd hired me to go ahead. I stayed up all night in Boston at my desk building this model and got on the plane. And I think people next to me were scared of me because I was like, don't, don't touch the model. Like, don't touch this box. And they're like, what is in that weird cardboard box? Like, um, but during the presentation, I was like, let's all go outside from the conference room. And we held the model up in the sunlight. And that was that they, they went for it, which was really exciting. Um, so during grad school, I got to watch the construction of this. It was like my first project, uh, basically an, a, an alleyway <laughs> in Miami. And so they let me design some of the facades here that would hold shops that faced into the alley. This was when the landscape was getting planted. We have this courtyard at the heart of it where the trees bloom out of season with each other. So there's always some kind of intrigue with flowers drawing people in from the smell, the, the petals drifting down the alley. And a lot of these things are captured from those sketchbooks and traveling through various places and backpacking and capturing memories from you know, getting lost in some random city and then trying to capture those qualities with the built work. This was right after it was completed uh, a few years ago. And over the years, over just the last three years, you know, this is the, this ru ruin almost. Shops have come in, and what's really beautiful, this is a fairly expensive retail neighborhood where you have luxury brands, Celine, Prada, all that stuff, and not many locally owned shops. So part of the program was like, how can we make spaces where local Miami businesses could afford to actually set up shop here, even if it's a pop-up? And thankfully, the alley has become so successful. You know, nobody was in there before when it was dumpsters. And now it's become one of the most photographed places in that part of Miami. So it's allowed shops to pop up in here and actually thrive. Uh, Aesop just opened, which is not a local small company, but all the others are. There's a little 
alcoholic ice cream parlor, which is really, that used to be a trash room before we opened this window into the alley, and that's been there three years. Initially, it was just supposed to be a pop-up, but they've, they've renewed their fourth year lease. Um, all kinds of people that work in the district take their breaks in here. It's a very casual, a lot of people tell me it feels like you're up and that, that feels pretty good because if you go outside of it, it's, it feels like an extremely high-end shopping mall. Um, so this, this place has become a little like heartbeat in an otherwise totally new district. Taco truck was a really nice addition. Uh, and this is, this is really fun. I just love going on Instagram and checking the tag and seeing how people use it from an art installation last year with these pink gorillas hanging in here to um, engagement photos, fashion shoots, selfies, you know, it, it, you can find everything. It's really fun to see something that was sitting on my desk all of a sudden be taken over by hundreds of people and made their own. So that's, that's it most recently. Um, and then that led to one little small project across the street, which was unifying a garage entry, a, a pedestrian bridge, and then a walkway up into another plaza. So we used rusted steel to organize this kind of trellis. This was also an alleyway previously, but kind of give a sculptural and material presence to a, a pretty small piece of infrastructure in the grand scheme of things. But it's become a favorite place to, for the luxury car dealers in Miami to photograph their new cars. Um, then most recently, moving back to Portland, when I worked at Allied Works, I started to make connections with people in the community that I thought I might want to work with eventually. And I got the privilege of meeting this awesome developer, Ryan Zygar, who's watching, um, a few years ago. And when I left Allied, he's always had this dream of doing a modern housing project in the periphery, like in the suburbs, bringing modern architecture to the suburbs in the Portland metro area. So last year he hired us to do a study for 20 houses in this type of environment in Philida, Washington, which we just won an award for. It's kind of funny, the first award the office wins is for a suburban master plan project. So something I never thought I'd be doing, but uh, we had a lot of fun designing these 20 homes to be almost like small wood sculptures that are very opaque to the kind of typical suburban views outside. But then on the back, they open into a wetland. You can see down here that has herons and fish and all kinds of nice things where the living rooms all open into play spaces that integrate with that very northwest kind of seasonal wetland. Um, this is still in process. Uh, that led then to our biggest project, which is the last project I'm going to show today. This is on North Lombard in Portland, and this is a lampshade shop that's been there for a really long time and a transformer next to it. But Ryan had the vision of bringing high density um, kind of efficiency units to North Portland in a brick building. Like brick is not built, glass and metal for, for condo buildings and apartments in Portland, but he really wanted to address some of these beautiful old institutional buildings here in North Portland, churches, community centers. Some of these buildings, like I, like I said earlier, this is not necessarily modern, but the fact that these have stood decades of trends and history and rain, there's something powerful about materials with mass and presence. So how can we make a, a new interpretation of this type of building um, for apartments? So we began to sketch back and forth and I began to learn the Portland zoning code really quick because I'd never worked on a developer building in Portland. Um, and we came up with this mass kind of monolith of brick that made sense, but we wanted to use the brick in a unique way where, where it didn't need to hold anything up, it became a screen. Because otherwise, just like I'm sure in Bend, most of the older buildings are wood with brick wrapping them. So I wanted to be really true about the tectonics of that. So it's a wood building, but then the brick skin I call it the corduroy jacket because it's extremely textured and then at night you actually see through parts of it where the bricks separate and light can shine out from inside. So again, here's the wood structure sleeved into the corduroy jacket of brick and uh, this, is, this is what it looks, it's in permitting right now, it'll break ground in March. Uh, 16 units, very uh, efficient, each unit gets a 20 square foot balcony facing towards downtown Portland. It looks like a monolith during the day, but at night you can see it shines out through the screen parts. And there's this beautiful texture uh, that unifies the screened and the purely veneer parts. So all over the walls, there's an incredible accepted roughness that I think is becoming part of what we do. 
So at night, it glows out like this. These are the little bathroom windows here. So you might see someone showering, uh, but you won't see everything. Um, so then here you can see a lot better this texture that unifies all the facades. And then at night, it, it glows. Whoop. And then the circulation inside, just because it's, we were in the middle of COVID, we we're like, how can we bring as much air, light, and just circulation into a very tight site? So all the hallways are exterior. There's a beautiful courtyard that a friend of mine from college, Gavin Uni, is going to be designing. Um, just kind of a hidden garden inside this monolith. And the units, it's a mass ply building, so we're going to expose that massive plywood that all the floor construction's made out of. And then there's this nice little box that has the kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom all unified. All the windows at each end are operable, and then you get this large, generous balcony. So in summer, your living room is half outside here at the end. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. We're really excited. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a second? Yeah, sure. Have a course. seat. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. And thanks to all of Daniel's clients that are tuning in, apparently. Yeah, so, you. yeah, that's quite <laughs> nice of you. <laughs> um, I'm so interested in your interest in alleyways and liminal spaces. And, and it's just, what do you, what do you think really happens in those places that you that you can make them more a part of your community instead of just these empty desolate places yeah I think we talked about it a little last night because scale house is actually on a really great alley where there's so much already started and the majority of alleys in the united states do not have you know don't have anybody willing to like open up shop on an alley because they've traditionally been dangerous um kind of the underbelly of cities but i think the thing that appealed to me, first of all, in Seattle is um, outside of the weekend, you know, when no, not a lot of people live right downtown Seattle, so it's pretty dead. I lived right on the edge of it, so I'd go explore on weekends, and it was like you had the city to yourself almost. And the alleys, because of the, Seattle has bigger blocks than Portland and bigger streets, so there's kind of this lack of intimacy. And you know, when, when you travel to, I don't know, Paris or Italy or we're all drawn to these tiny little streets that are at the scale of the human body. And I think that the alleys, that's kind of what they stood out to me as. It's like this untapped potential. They were there for the stuff. Mainly alleys were built for transporting waste and goods in mm -hmm. American cities because mm -hmm. cars were already such a big part of our mm -hmm. grids, et cetera. But I think now people are realizing like, oh, we can be more intelligent with our infrastructure and we have all these, you know, Chicago has like hundreds of miles of alleys. It's crazy. They have the most alleys out of any, any city in the world. Um, and just realizing that these things are an untapped potential for pedestrian infrastructure. And I think that the, the other thing I talked about last night a little bit, the thing that I think is so special about them is because they haven't had, you know, there's a cer certain amount of money put into the facades on the street of buildings and the lobbies and the show, like the display cases, et cetera. There's not that on alleys. Alleys are usually just left to the elements and history. So you get this amazing patina and layers of history and stories that don't exist in other parts of cities. So they're, they're ready to be used in a better way. <laughs> and they can be so much fun when they're, when they're done well. Um, how do you differentiate between, how is your approach different between pro, um, residential and commercial? Because you do both. Are there different priorities that you kind of um, take into account? No, uh, I mean, the logistics of the program, I mean, we're, I'm, I'm really excited that uh, through great clients, we've been able to do, we're continuing to be able to do really awesome houses, but I dream of doing uh, public buildings so that mm -hmm. all the efforts that go into making houses and buildings can be shared by everybody. I'm, I'm really excited to see how to how to get into that i would love to do a library community center an art center something that lots of different types of people are going to enjoy for many years to come rather than a single family or a series of tenants so i think the thing those three elements that i talked about at the beginning mm -hmm. though those are mm -hmm. always sitting in in the back of my mind no matter what the building is mm -hmm. but um 
I think it's been new for me with this apartment building, learning that you can't control every single last little inch. Like with the houses, I get like extremely obsessive compulsive <laughs> with every little detail. But in a bigger building, you have to let some of that go and focus on the stronger big idea. And that's mm -hmm. something I'm learning how to do, but it, it's equally as rewarding. Good, good. I look forward to seeing some of these projects. Thanks. And we want you to come fix our alley. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very much for joining us. Next up will be Rob Mills in just a few minutes, so stay tuned.